Okay, as uh, we get set up, let me just uh, say a few words of introduction. Uh, welcome to our first event of the special year on statistical machine learning. This is a, a program put on by the Department of Statistics and the Tripods Institute at Columbia University. Uh, today is our, the first day of our statistical machine learning boot camp. It'll run uh, the three days, uh, today, tomorrow, and Thursday. Um, so the goal of these lectures is to introduce uh, new um, students, faculty, people interested in um, statistical machine learning uh, uh, to and foundations of data science uh, to, to techniques and, uh, that are core to the foundation uh, of doing research in um, uh, data science and machine learning. Um, the two other events we have for the semester are a workshop on st statistical machine learning on March 27th and 28th and some tutorials on reinforcement learning in May 2nd. Uh, so take a look at our website for more information about these events. Um, and we'll, we'll get started momentarily. Okay, so Ben is here. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm going now uh, to talk about concentration of measure. And uh, what is concentration of measure? In general, this is a kind of statement that some random variables are close to the expectation with high probability. So this is the kind of statement that we would like to uh, be able to prove. And uh, as a motivating exa example, let's imagine that we have a bunch of random variables x1, xn that are just 0, 1, like a, a maybe biased coin flip with some probability this one, oh, with some probability uh, p of landing head. And we would like to uh, estimate the, the mean of this, uh, of this random variable xi. One way to do this is to look at the empirical average. So we take a bunch of independent copies of xi and we look at the empirical average. And uh, we were, what we would like to say is that with high probability, this empirical average is actually close to the uh, true mean. And the kind of statement that we will, will be I did something wrong, sorry. And the kind of statement that we will be able to prove is that the probability that this empirical average deviates from the mean by at least lambda is bounded by exponential in negative lambda squared n. So in particular, this decays exponentially with the number of samples we take. Uh, so one way, of, one way to think about this kind of inequality is that if you look at this random variable, like this average of uh, xi, uh, this is a random variable with a standard deviation 1 over square root, about 1 over square root n. So what we are saying is that the tails of this, like the, the, the way it's concentrated around its expectations, are just as good as if it was a Gaussian random variable with a mean, uh, that, with a standard deviation that's the same as the uh, standard deviation of this random variable. So uh, like we have an average of a, lo a lot of independent random variables. We are saying that it is just as well concentrated as if we had a Gaussian distribution here. And this is, by the way, how I often think, like 
as a first approximation when I'm trying to work with concentration of random variables. Even if my random variables are not Gaussian, let's just pretend that they are Gaussian. Let's co just compute the, uh, the standard deviation of whatever random variable I end up with and uh, hope that it's as concentrated as Gaussian, as Gaussian with this kind of standard deviation. And we will be able to prove that often it is the case. Now, we know that there is this other statement, central limit theorem, which is of similar, similar flavor, which says that the average of many independent random variables is close in distribution to, uh, to, to, to uh, Gaussian random variable with the same standard deviation. Now, this is two, like, by itself, those are uh, statements of similar flavor, but they, are, they don't imply each other. In particular, if we, only, if we wanted to use central limit theorem to get this kind of concentration, like tail bands, probabilities that my uh, variable deviates from the mean by, uh, by lambda, the best I could get is that those, those probabilities are at most one over square root n. Just because better SN or, or kind of central limit theorem tells me that the rate of convergence to a Gaussian is like uh, one over square root n, whereas uh, the kind of uh, concentration inequalities that we want to prove should have a dependence, ideally should have dependence exponential in negative n, exponential in number of samples. Okay, so this is one kind of inequalities that we will be proving. This is great. Okay. So this is the one kind of inequalities that we'll be proving, but I want to give you a little bit more general way of thinking about how to prove those kind of inequalities. And I'm going to prove a theorem here that by itself doesn't really look like a concentration of measured theorem. That's like a theorem in high dimensional geometry, which I think is pretty cool, and it has a lot of uh, algorithmic applications. So the theorem is following. If I have a bunch of points, say n points in, the, in high dimensional space, in RD, then I claim that there is a linear map from Rd to much smaller space Rm. So this is so-called dimensionality reduction that preserves up to some small multiplicative distortion one plus epsilon is going to preserve all the distances between all pairs of points. And I will be able to reduce my original dimension D all the way to dimension log n over epsilon squared. Note that this doesn't depend at all on uh, what dimension I started with. And the dependence on the number of points that I have is only logarithmic. So I can uh, like, reduce this dimension drastically, and I will still preserve all the distances between all pairs of points. So we will try to prove this kind of theorem. Why we will be proving this theorem in uh, the talk about concentration of measure? Just because it follows from a slightly stronger statement that's probabilistic in nature. The way we will prove it is we will show a distribution of a linear maps. And we'll prove that for any single fixed vector y, if I choose a linear map t from this distribution, then probability that I, the probability that I disturb the length of the vector y by more than epsilon, say multiplicatively by more than one plus epsilon, this probability is smaller than delta. And I do this. Uh, by uh, projecting onto the dimension log one over delta over epsilon square. So I come up with some uh, distribution of random matrices such that for every fixed vector v, with huge probability, I'm, preser I'm preser approximately preserving is none. And now, if I have this statement, then I claim that this, this johnson linden strauss follows quite easily. Namely, I just take delta to be, like this failure probability here to be smaller than one over n square. And uh, I can apply this distribution of JL to all vectors xi minus xj. There is n square of them. Probability that I fail to preserve norm of any of those vectors is smaller than 1 over n square. So by union band, probability that any of those, th there exist vectors that, uh, which norms is disturbed is smaller than 1. Hence, there exists at least one matrix that preserves all those norms. Is this, is this clear? at this point. You should, by the way, interrupt me whenever you have any kind of questions. Yes? 
Uh, okay, so uh, yes, great, great question. So the uh, way I'm going, so this uh, this uh, distribution in JL will uh, says that for every fixed vector y, the norm of this vector y is preserved. Now I'm going to apply it for, uh, for vectors of form x i minus x j, and note that the norm of t norm of t x i minus x j. This is just the same as t x i minus t x j by linearity. So now, uh, first I'm going to prove that once I have just a single fixed vector, I'm going to preserve it with huge probability. Then I'm going to apply this to all the vectors of form x i minus x j to say that I'm preserving all periodic distances with good probability. OK. Uh, no, I did this again. OK. Uh, excellent. So I won't be talking about this theorem anymore. We, we are talking about uh, like probability here. So I'm going to focus only on this uh, distribution of JL. And note that this is a concentration of a measure kind of statement. So we will most likely choose a distribution of matrices such that this expectation of a, the random matrix T of the squared norm ty squared is equal to whatever I wanted it to be, y squared. And all I need to prove is that with huge probability, this random variable is actually close to its expectation. If I prove this, I have this distribution of Johnson Linden stuff. So, uh, so the, like this is the, the kind of statement that I, I promised you in the beginning I, I, I want to be interested in. And in general, proving this distribution in JL these days is not too difficult. We are going to work much, much more uh, to do this. I, I want to show you. Yes? I think the, the S1 should be the epsilon times the norm of one squared. Uh, yes. Great, great, great point. This is epsilon times the norm of y squared. Uh, yes. Perfect. Uh, so, in general, proving this is not too difficult. I'm going to introduce a, a little bit more machinery. I'm going, you, you should have this theorem in the back of my, your mind during the entire talk. And uh, I want to show that this theorem kind of follows from, like, I'm going to introduce a, a way of thinking about concentration of measure. And at some point, this theorem will be just a, a corollary of something that we have done. But let's, let's keep this as a motivating example. All right. So now let's. Uh, Ah, by the way, why this is a motivating example? Why would such a johnston linder stokes lemma be useful? One nice way of using this in uh, like uh, algorithmic application is so-called so sketch and solve paradigm. Imagine that I have a high dimensional problem. Say I have a bunch of uh, high dimensional data points and I want to run my fa favorite algorithms, like K means on this problem. Maybe like this algorithm might depend quite badly on the dimension of the data set. So what I could do is I could start by applying johnson linder stars to the entire data set. Uh, I like dimensionality reduction. I know that I preserved all the previous distances. Now I can run my uh, favorite algorithm on this much smaller, like the, the data set that's just as large but much lower dimensional. Hopefully my, my algorithm will be faster. And then maybe because all of the distances are preserved by this dimensionality reduction. Maybe I can say that the solution that I got is not too much, too much worse than the solution I would have gotten if I just used the, the algorithm on the large data set. So this is how, how we, we want to use this johnson linder stars. OK, let's uh, now forget, for, well, let's not now have this johnson linder stars in the back of our heads. And let's talk about concentration of measure. Uh, so the most basic concentration of measure kind of inequality that we are going to build uh, on is a so-called Markov inequality. And it's just saying that whenever I have a non-negative random variable, probability that is larger than lambda is at most expectation of, of x over lambda. And like, I, I guess you've seen this inequality. It has a proof that's very short. Uh, why this is a concentration of measure kind of thing? Uh, because, uh, well, uh, okay, so 
the, like, the simple corollary of this uh, Markov inequality is so-called Chebyshev inequality. So if I have uh, my random variable x, then absolute value of x minus ex, min minus expectation, this is a non-negative random variable. I can apply a Markov inequality to this non-negative random variable to get some sort of concentration of measure kind of statement to say that this, the probability that x deviates from its expectation by, by at least lambda is smaller than something. One useful trick to, to do is that I, equivalently I can just raise both of sides of this inequality to the p power. So probability that x minus ex is larger than lambda is the same as probability that x minus ex to the p power is larger to the lambda than lambda to the p. And now I can apply the uh, uh, Markov inequality to this to get a Chebyshev inequality. So this is the, the first kind of actual concentration of measured kind of inequality that we, 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 we want to be, we are interested in. So as soon as I can upper bound this expectation, this expectation of x minus ex to the p power, I will be getting some kind of concentration of measured kind of statement that this Deviation probability that this deviation is larger than lambda is upper bounded by uh, by whatever I can upper bound this over lambda to the p. So in particular, like one way of rewriting this is that probability that this deviates from the random variable x deviates from the expectation by more than lambda times this factor is upper bounded by one over lambda to the p, and Whenever you can show, like often for a nice random variable x, we will be able to show that this p norm is upper bounded by some constants times the second norm. Second norm here is just of x minus ex is just a standard deviation. Like x my expectation of x minus ex squared is just the variance of my random variable. So this thing here is just a standard deviation. As soon as you can show that the L, the, this, this p moment is bounded by some constant time standard deviation. I'm getting a concentration of measure inequality that probability that the my random variable deviates from this, its expectation by almost lambda times standard deviation is upper bounded by one over lambda to the p. So probability that my random variable is away from its expectation by more than 10 standard deviations is at most one over lambda, uh, 10 to the p. Like trivially, we can get this inequality for p equals two. So one special and most important case of, of uh, Chebyshev inequality is for p equals two. It's just saying that probability that the x deviates from my from its expectation by more than lambda standard deviations is bounded by one over lambda square. But in general, if we can, for our favorite random variables, if we can bound these quantities, uh, so, so those are the p moments of the p centered moments of x. Whenever I can have an upper bound on this p moment of x, then I get a concentration of measure band for my random variable. Those are, in a way, equivalent. Now, those are, like, why do we care? Because, because those p norms are actually very nice to work with, and getting those kind of inequalities is much, is much easier than getting the concentration inequalities directly. And specifically, one cool, feels, cool thing about the p norm is that they are norms. So they satisfy the triangle inequality and all the like, remaining stuff, the homogeneity and all this, this stuff. But triangle inequality is the important one. This is like, it takes a little bit of a, a trick to prove this triangle inequality. Uh, so like, now we can actually bound the p, mom, p moments or p norms of our sum of random variables by something in terms of the p moments of the uh, random, var like, uh, random variables that I started with. This is actually too bad to, to get really good concentration inequalities because this holds even if x and y are not independent. So this couldn't give us the concentration inequalities that we wanted to get. Uh, but this is useful to, to work with. Moreover, those norms are monotone, so if I change p to be so slightly larger, I'm going to get that the p, p norm is uh, slightly la is, is larger. And the, 
limit of this is so-called uh, essential supremum. So the L infinity norm of my random variable is just the largest values that this, this random variable uh, attains. So uh, if my random variable is with positive probability larger than something, this is the, the L infinity norm of my random variable X. Now, we said that the, uh, whenever I have a moment band, so whenever I can band this X minus expectation of X P moment, I'm getting a corresponding tail band, concentration band by a, a Chebyshev inequalities. What I want to say now is that those things are in a way equivalent. In the other, on the other hand, if I have if I know that my random variable is actually well concentrated, then the moments should be bounded. It's not, it's not quite equivalent. So if, let's say that I have my random variable y that has a like, mean zero random variable for, for the sake of discussion, that has the tail bounds just as if it, just as if it had p, p norm bounded by tau. I claim that this implies, this doesn't quite imply that it has the p, p, p non bounded by tau, but every q non that's for q smaller than p is actually bounded by some constant times tau. So on one hand, if I know that the p non is bounded by tau, I'm getting this inequality. If I have this inequality, I know that all the smaller q norms are actually bounded by tau. So in a way, those two things are equivalent, and we should be thinking of them as equivalent. So we should be like, kind of freely jumping between the concentration kind of inequalities and the moment bounds, and use whichever are convenient at a, uh, at a given situation. And the proof of this is very simple. Like, uh, without loss of generality, I can assume that this tau is one. I can assume that Q is one because I'm giving a talk. And uh, if I want to, upper band expectation of the of of y to the q power i can do this by integration by pairs so i just integrate the probability that y is larger than lambda and this thing integrates to a constant so there is some very short proof that you can just integrate stuff and you will get uh, that if you if you started with some concentration inequalities you can get back the moment band as well so the main message here is that when we are thinking about concentration inequalities, we should be thinking that they are equivalent uh, to moment bounds, and we should be freely jumping between one, one and the other. Now, uh, let me just uh, remind you briefly a few properties of a Gaussian random variable. Because in the end, we want to be proving that uh, some sort of uh, random variables are just as well concentrated as Gaussians. So we start with bad random variables that are independent. We take an average, we want to get a Gaussian. So what is a Gaussian? Gaussian is this, uh, like there is some sort of distribution and it has, uh, let's say that uh, it has mean zero and uh, variance one. It has this nice property that it's stable. So if I choose, a, this is called stability. If I choose an independent copies of a, a Gaussian and look at the sum with coefficients AI, this has the same distribution as just a single independent Gaussian rescaled by L2 norm of the vector A. So this is just square root of sum of AI square. So this is the most important property of a Gaussian distribution. Moreover, the concentration of a Gaussian variable around its mean is extremely strong. So probability that it's larger than lambda for any lambda is smaller than exponential negative lambda square. And in fact, uh, the, uh, we can explicitly compute all the moments of a Gaussian and they grow like square root of P. So we know that all of those moments are bounded by some sort of expression that depends on P and we know that it has very nice tails. Now, and so let's, let's keep those properties in mind and we'll be comparing some random variables with a Gaussian and we'll be getting that some averages of random variables have the same kind of great uh, concentrations as a Gaussian. So uh, to do this, I need uh, one more tricky tool. It's called a moment generating function. And I'm just going to define it. It's not very intuitive to start with, but we will see why this is a, a helpful tool to use. Uh, 
So moment for a random variable x, I'm going to define this object called moment generating function, capital field x of lambda as expectation of e to the lambda x. And I'm going to define the log of moment generating function as log of moment generating function. So why would I define a, like a weird creature like that? It has one really nice property. So by the way, I usually don't, like I usually want to work with moment generating function as little as possible. It has one nice property. We'll use just this uh, one nice property and we'll try not to, to, to touch it too much. So the nice property is that if X and Y are independent, then I can express the moment generating function of the sum of those random variables in terms of moment generating function of the corresponding random variables. So this is just moment generating function of x plus y. It's just expectation of e to the lambda x plus y. This is like, uh, by the fact that x and y are independent, this is the same as expectation of e to the lambda x times expectation of e to the lambda y, which is by definition, it's like the, the, the product of the uh, moment generating functions that I started with. And why did I define this log of moment generating function? Because this expression becomes even nicer. It just says that the log of moment generating function is additive with respect to the random variable variables here when they are independent. So now that this here, the independence assumption is crucial. When I switch from expectation of e to the lambda x times e to the lambda y to the product of the expectation. Now, why is it called moment generating function? Because I can express like this exponent, uh, this exponential has a proper, proper series uh, expansion. So I can write that phi of x is sum over p of lambda to the p e to the expectation of x to the p divided by p factorial. What does it mean? It means that if I can upper band this moment generating function by something, it gives me an upper band on all the moments simultaneously. Now, this is when we should start expecting that I'm going somewhere. But this actually like has, that there is actually hope that we will start proving some, some concentration of measure inequalities. So first of all, I told you that uh, I can express a moment generating function of a sum in terms of moment generating functions of the, the random variables that I started with. And moreover, if I can bound a moment generating function of a sum, then I can bound moments of my sum. And I told you that moment bounds are the same as concentration inequalities. So if I have those kind of moment bounds, I could hope to uh, just apply the Trebuchet inequality to this and get a concentration of my variable x. In other words, if I start with variables for which I know that this moment generating function is bounded and I add them together, I have a band on the moment generating function of a sum. This gives me a band on, the, on all the moments. If I have bands on all the moments, I could hope to get a concentration inequalities. This is kind of like, this seems like a fairly long plan, but I, like, bear with me for one more second. I am actually going somewhere. Let's try. And uh, we'll prove all of this by definition. Uh, I'm going to define a sub-Gaussian random variable. So, uh, by the way, I can actually compute this moment generating function of a Gaussian exactly. If I start with a Gaussian random variable, I can compute this expectation. This is just like doing some sort of integral. And it turns out that this is e to the lambda square over two. So the log moment generating function of a Gaussian is just lambda square over two. Now, for the sake of convenience, I'm going to define a sub-Gaussian random variable to be any random variable that has a moment generating function bounded by uh, the moment generating function of a corresponding Gaussian. So I'm going to define uh, subgression random variable only for mean zero random variables. People usually define it more generally. This is nicer. Uh, so my mean zero random variable is a subgaussian if and only if this moment with parameter sigma, if and only if this uh, 
moment generating function is bounded by whatever is the moment generating function of the corresponding Gaussian with a variance sigma, with a standard deviation sigma. This is a definition, and uh, as I told you, I like, don't want to work with moment generating function too much. This thing of being sub Gaussian, it has nicer, like, there are nicer way of thinking about it that we'll get to, but good thing about this definition is that uh, I immediately have two nice properties. First of all, if I have a, like this is a, just a simple fact, if I have a single sigma sub Gaussian and the variable, and I scale it by a constant, this is just a, this is C sigma sub Gaussian. So this sigma here, you should think as a, some sort of standard, like some sort of standard, standard deviation of my random variable, some sort of scale parameter. If I rescale a random variable by a constant, this parameter rescales by the same kind of constant. Moreover, the important fact is that if I have some, a bunch of independent sub Gaussian random variables, then their sum is again sub Gaussian with a parameter that looks like you know, the variance of a corresponding Gaussian. So we know that if we have uh, like x1 to, to xn are Gaussians with a standard deviation sigma i, then this it would be again Gaussian with this, same, with this kind of standard deviation. What I'm saying is that if my random variables are sub Gaussian, then the sum is sub Gaussian with a, uh, with a standard deviation that looks like the, the standard deviation of a corresponding Gaussian. And the way, the, the reason why I define this uh, being sub Gaussian in terms of the moment generating function is so that this fact is very easy to prove. I want to prove that this is sub Gaussian. I need to upper bound the moment generating function of the sum of my random, independent copies of my random variable. But I know that this like, log moment generating function is just additive. And, uh, and I know that each of those, like because all of those variables that I started with are sub Gaussian. So they are just, uh, like, the way I, I, we should be thinking about sub Gaussian random variable is that this random variable to begin with is concentrated just as well as, as a Gaussian with a standard division sigma. So if they, were, if they were that concentrated, then I have upper bounds on the moment generating functions of each x, xi. I can uh, just apply them, and uh, this gives me an upper band on the moment generating function of a sum. Uh, so the, like, I, I didn't really do much. I defined moment generating function. I told you that the one cool thing about moment generating function is that I can upper band a moment generating function of a sum by a sum of the, the moment generating functions of a, a random variables that I started with, and I just did this. Uh, okay, so like so, the, so so this actually is kind of promising. This is uh, this uh, so uh, so uh, this looks like a, a way to get the, the concentration inequalities we wanted we, we wanted to get. So namely, we wanted to say that our sum or average of uh, our favorite random variables is just as well concentrated as a Gaussian. If we knew that our variables X, that we started with were already sub-Gaussian with a standard division sigma, then we could just use this fact to say that the sum or average is again sub-Gaussian. Being sub-Gaussian means that I have a band on moment generating function. Having a band on moment generating function should give me a bands on moments and bands on the tail. So I should actually get a concentration that I, I wanted to get. And this is actually uh, maybe like, so the, the, the question is how do I even get any sub Gaussian random variable to start with that's not a Gaussian? And this is, yes? Each of those uh, xi's are sigma i sub Gaussian. Do we need that where we're also in the inequality? Where? Uh, okay, so 
I defined being sigma sub Gaussian to have a log moment generating function by, bounded by sigma squared times lambda squared. So this whole thing is uh, my new sigma square, which means that my new sigma is square root of the, this whole thing. The reason I'm putting square roots here is that like, this, this should be on the same kind of, this should have kind of the same units as, as I'm starting with. Like, this, this homogeneity property, uh, I want it to work. Uh, so in this inequality, I won't have a square root, but given this inequality, I'm getting that this is, uh, the sum is square root of sig sum of sigma i squares of Gaussian. So the way you should think about it is that like, if those variables were actually Gaussian with a standard deviation sigma i, they are in particular sigma i sub Gaussian, and then this sum is a Gaussian with this kind of standard deviation. And I'm saying that this is a little bit more general statement. I'm not starting with a Gaussian, but I still want to have uh, uh, like the same kind of uh, additivity of whatever parameter I'm using instead of standard deviation now. And by the way, often this sigma i, like for my random variables of interest, often this sigma i that I'm starting with is going to be comparable to actual standard uh, deviation of a random variable. So what are those, uh, like, uh, now, why, why, why this whole madness is actually relatively easy to work with on a daily basis? I've introduced uh, quite a bunch of random tools, and it might be a bit confusing. What I want to say is that uh, if you are actually a little bit more accustomed with this, it is very easy to work with and very easy to come up with uh, uh, like whatever concentration inequality you want to have. And the reason is that uh, there is a bunch of, up to a constant factor, equivalent statements uh, telling me what, what does it mean for a random variable to be sub-Gaussian. First of all, I defined it to have some bounds on the moment generating function, which might not be the most intuitive way of thinking about it. I guess the most intuitive way of thinking uh, about it is that if I have defined my uh, sub-Gaussian random variable like this, then actually the probability that its deviation from zero is larger than lambda times whatever is this parameter sigma is upper bounded by exponential in negative lambda square. So if I have the sub Gaussian random variable, then it has tail bands just the same as uh, like upper bounded by the same, uh, by the tail bands of corresponding Gaussian. Moreover, uh, if I have a, uh, sub Gaussian random variable, then it has moments upper bound, bounded by moments of a corresponding Gaussian. I said, I said that those things are uh, equivalent up to a constant factor. What I mean by this is that if I get a random variable that, has a, that is sigma sub Gaussian, I can, for example, deduce, so I, I have this MGF band, I can deduce the tail bands. From the tail bands, I could get by the integration by part, I could get the moment bands. Moment, if I have this kind of moment band, I could actually get a corresponding upper band on the moment generating function. And if I go the whole circle, like I started with a sigma sub Gaussian and I might end up with five sub sigma sub Gaussian or something. I may lose some constant factor here in the, the scale parameter, but up to those constant factors, I'm, like those, those things are equivalent. So what does it mean is that whenever I want to show a concentration, I have a bunch of uh, random variables, mean zero random variables, or arbitrary random variables. I can just subtract the mean, so they are mean zero. I want to show the concentration. As soon as I can prove any of those conditions, say I can prove that a moment band for a single random variable that I care about, xi, that it has the moments that are bounded by corresponding Gaussian. Now I know that my random variable is sigma sub Gaussian. Without any work, I, I, I can say, oh, by the way, because of the moment generating function magic, the sum of independent copies of those are like square root n sigma sub Gaussian. If I know that the sum is, uh, is sub Gaussian, without any work, I can deduce the corresponding tail gauss. 
But, so I can say that it is, in fact, just as well concentrated as a corresponding Gaussian. So if you want to prove, let's actually do this. Uh, maybe we'll get it uh, later. So remember the inequality that I started with, that if you have a bunch of coin flips, then the average of those coin flips is concentrated just as well as a Gaussian around uh, its mean. So the, like this is the so-called halving inequality. If, if I have a bunch, in general, if I have a bunch of bounded random variable, then uh, the, uh, maybe, this little bit more special case. So I, I started, the, back in the days, I started with this uh, nice example. I have a bunch of zero, one, and variables. I promised you that the average of xi's minus p is concentrated as a Gaussian with a standard deviation sigma. So this, this statement is just a statement that this random variable here is sigma sub Gaussian with sigma being one over square root n. How do I prove it? Well, if I knew that each of my xi is one sub Gaussian, then like, that, would, uh, that would directly follow. I would know each of xi's are one sub Gaussian, so this entire sum is square root n sub Gaussian. I divide it by n, so this whole thing is one over square root n sub Gaussian. It, 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 since it is sub Gaussian, it has the tail bands on the same order as the, the Gaussian with standard deviation square root n, and those are the, 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 the tail bands. Probability that is larger than lambda is bounded by exponential in negative lambda square n. Uh, so the bottom line is that. Showing this equivalence takes some technical work that's not particularly difficult, but uh, it's a little bit tedious. And you've seen most of it. You've seen why the uh, tail bands imply some sort of moment bands. You've seen why the MGF bands imply some sort of moment bands. If you want to get from moment bands to the MGF bands, you again expand this as a series. So you can believe that it is possible to prove this equivalence. Now, if, if you have already went through the motion and proved this equivalence, using it is actually super simple. So you want to prove the concentration for your, uh, for your favorite sum of random variables xi. You want to say that this is, so this is a little bit more general statement than the, the example I started with. I want to say that if each of those variables are, is bounded by AI, not necessarily, the band is not necessarily the same, then the sum of XI is concentrated around its uh, expectation as if it was a Gaussian with a standard deviation L2 norm of a vector A. How do I prove it? Well, I need to show that those random variables uh, YI are sub-Gaussian. The easiest way to show it is in this case, proving a, a moment bound. It is, I, like, since they are bounded, it is actually extremely simple to see that all of those moments are just bounded by, by AI. So obviously they are bounded by AI times square root P, so corresponding moments of a Gaussian random variable with standard division AI. I know that all of those summons are sub-Gaussian. Uh, therefore, the sum of those is sub-Gaussian with a parameter L to norm of A. This is the same kind of parameter that I would get if, I, if those variables were actually Gaussian. Are there any questions at this point? So uh, like this is, this is uh, having an inequality. This is one of the very useful ones. But in general, uh, proving those kind of inequalities, like, uh, at times, you won't have a bounded variable to start with. But as soon as you are able to prove some sort of moment bounds for your random variables, you will be able to get the concentration bounds for a sum. 
kind of in a black boxy way, without without like, going through too, too much mess. Uh, okay, let's go back to this uh, Johnson Linden Strauss, and let's see if we can prove it now. Uh, so what was the uh, Johnson Linden Strauss? We had some vector y. We wanted to find a distribution of linear maps such that the L2 norm square of the Ty is close to the actual uh, L2 norm square of y with high probability. I'm going to choose a, take a matrix with independent Gaussian entries. So each entry is independent Gaussian. And uh, oh, so this, this up here should be L2 norm of y square again. Uh, but let's assume that uh, L2 norm of y is just equal to 1. Just because all of this is scale invariant. Like this, this map is linear, right? Now, uh, if I choose matrix T to be matrix with independent Gaussian entries, what is L2 norm square of T y? This is just sum of all the, like sum of square of all the coordinates. Each coordinate is an inner product of a Gaussian, of a uh, eight row of my matrix T with a vector Y square. Those are the, the coordinates. Now, uh, there is this, like, uh, as, as I started, the most important property of a Gaussian distribution is that this thing here has exactly the same distribution as a Gaussian random variable with standard deviation one over square root n. So if I choose my distribution of random matrices to have just independent Gaussian entry at each, uh, like independent Gaussian entries, then I know that the, for any, any vector of uh, uh, norm one, the distribution of the Ty square is just a sum of squares of standard independent Gaussians. Or like with a correct, you know, with a correct scaling, this is just basically an average of squares of standard independent Gaussians. This is so-called chi-square distribution, and you can just check, check on Wikipedia that it's concentrated. But let's prove that, so we have, a, again, a statement that we have a bunch of independent Gaussian random variables, standard independent Gaussian random variables, z1 to zm. If I prove that average of its squares is concentrated, around, mean of this is 1. Right? Mean, mean of this is 1. If I prove that this average of squares of independent Gaussians is concentrated around its mean fairly well, I'm going to get this, this uh, distribution of Johnson Linden stars. So this is very much like the, the kind of statements that we are proving uh, uh, a second before. I know that each of my random variables, Z, like each my, of my random variables that I'm starting with is somewhat nice, is a square of a Gaussian. I want to say that the average of them is extremely well concentrated. Now, if I knew that my random variables zi square are sub-Gaussian, then I wouldn't have to do anything anymore, right? I would say, okay, I, I just like, check the moments or whatever, zi squares are sub-Gaussians, this is sub-Gaussian, so I'm, I'm good. Uh, can we hope for it to be true? Is it likely that this, like, if I start with a Gaussian random variable, this z squared minus expectation is sub-Gaussian? Well, imagine, like, take some large lambda. What is the probability that z squared is away from the, its expectation by at least lambda? Turns out that this probability is on the order of exponential in negative lambda. It's not exponential in negative lambda squared. So those random variables are not, in fact, uh, sub-Gaussian. Okay? That's too bad. I've like, defined this entire sub-Gaussian business. And it didn't end up being useful here. But uh, it shouldn't be too discouraging. I do know that this random variable is, in fact, very, fairly well concentrated. Uh, like each of those ga uh, Gaussian square is fairly well concentrated around its expectation. It's not exponentially negative lambda square. It's exponentially negative lambda. It's still not too bad. 
this should imply some sort of moment bounds for each of the like, random variables. I, I should hope to be able to get a, a concentration as soon as I have some moment bounds for each of the random variables that I'm averaging, I should be able to get a concentration band for the average. And uh, since those are not sub-Gaussians, we'll prove this by another definition. I'm going to define a sub-gamma random variable that have this kind of tails. It's going to be a little bit more general. And I'm going to get, again define it in terms of a moment generating function. So now, I'm defining it so that just because the previous random variables were not sub-Gaussians, I would like to have the similar kind of framework that will work for my random variables that are squares of a Gaussian. So for me, a random variable is sigma b sub gamma. Now I have two parameters. If again I have a upper band on a moment generating function, the same as Gaussian with a standard deviation sigma, but only up to a point, only up to a point where the, the, the parameter is at most one over uh, capital B. And now, again, I define it in terms of moment generating function. So at least it's easy to show uh, some sort of additivity property. If I start with sub gamma random variables, then sum of those is again sub gamma. With what kind of parameters? Well, I have all those bands up to one minimum of one over bi. So this, so I can upper bound the moment generating function of a sum up to one over maximum bi. And the upper bound is of the same form as if they were Gaussian. So, uh, uh, so if my random variables are sub gamma, then a sum of uh, random variables are like this is again sub gamma. And now my hope is to show that in fact, the square of a Gaussian is sub gamma. And maybe again, we can say something like, oh, by the way, like moment for sub gamma random variables, this MGF band and moment bands and tail bands and everything is the same. And, and did use whatever we wanted. So in fact, this is true. It's a little bit more annoying for the sub gamma than with sub Gaussian, but oh well. So, if my random variables has uh, this moment generating function band, then in fact, I can band all the moment by sigma times square root p, those are the moments of a Gaussian, plus b times p, those are the moments of a like, exponential distribution or something. Or from this moment band, I can, for example, get the corresponding tail bands. You might have seen the tail bands like this. It's saying that some gamma random variables has tails that up to some point look basically like sub Gaussian and later they decay only exponentially in lambda. And, uh, you know, like if you have those uh, tail bands, you can deduce that it's sub gamma. If you have uh, moment bands, you can deduce back that it's sub gamma the same way. Uh, okay, so what is, uh, like, ex so, the, so, uh, Okay, so I guess, uh, uh, yes, so let's finish the, the, the Johnson Linden Strauss now with the new technology. Uh, all we wanted to prove is that sum of squares of uh, independent Gaussian random variables is well concentrated around its expectation. What do I need to do this to prove it? First, I'm going to show that each of those square of Gaussian minus expectation is actually sub gamma. And I can choose my favorite condition here. For example, it's easy to prove the tail bands, that each of them have tail bands bounded by exponential in negative lambda. So each of the variables that I started with is one one uh, is sub gamma with parameters one and one, and uh, by the additivity property of the sub gamma random variables, the sum of those guys is sub gamma with parameters square root m and one, which, again, by the like whole equivalent business, 
if I know that my lambda variable is sub gamma, I can uh, I can bound the deviations from it. I can get a tape band for deviation of the expectation. Probability that it's, this deviation is larger than m times epsilon is at most uh, like whatever I told you, the, the sub-Gaussian part and the sub-exponential part. You it turns out that this whole thing is uh, much smaller than this thing. So in fact, what we will, in, in our case of Johnson linden Strauss, with the setting of parameters that we have, what will end up is that the, the deviations are bounded by exponential in negative m epsilon square. And now if we choose m to be log one over delta over epsilon square and plug those things in, we actually get that the probability that my average Q deviates from the expectation by the m most epsilon is smaller than delta. Uh, that finishes the, the Johnson Linden Strauss. Now, there is, like, since I've uh, introduced all of those uh, sub gamma random variables, I can just as well uh, prove one more concentration inequalities as a corollary that is actually super useful. And uh, one that uh, is good to be aware of at least. So let's say that I have a bunch of random variables that are bounded, but not only they are bounded, maybe the bands are as, as good, I also know that the standard deviations are very small. So let's say that the standard deviations are actually much smaller than the bands I have on the random variable. Maybe I can hope to get some decent uh, concentration band of the sum of those random variables. And it turns out that in fact it is true that some of random variables like this has those mixed tails that are sub-Gaussian up to a point and sub-exponential later on. So this sum is sub-gamma, this is called Bernstein inequality, and it's like actually a super useful thing to be aware of. And the way we prove it is again, you just note, notice that a single variable like this is sigma ibi sub gamma, so the sum is sub gamma, so you can conclude the, the tail bounds. Uh, now, just to have some sort of idea why, like, in what kind of situations this Bernstein band is useful and is better than the previous Hefding band. Imagine that you have a random variable, xi, which is one with probability one over n. And you add n random variables like this. So in expectation, you expect this to sum to be around one. And we want to say that this is well concentrated around its expectation. If we just use the have the inequality, we, all we know that is that the random variables are xi are bounded by one, so we would get a sub-Gaussian kind of concentration on a scale that looks like square root n. So we know that this, this random variable sum of xi is in fact in expectation one, and it should be close to, we would, we would want to prove theorems of form that it's actually close to one with huge probability, but what we will be getting is that, just using Hefting, is that it's a, you know, around square root n with sub-Gaussian tails. Whereas with the Bernstein inequality, if you just plug in uh, values probability, just because like, here we have this standard deviation that's so much smaller than the band we have on the random variable, we will be able to get that probability that x, the sum of xi deviates from from its expectation by more than lambda is actually bounded by exponential in negative lambda. So this random variable, uh, like this random variable actually kind of looks like an exponential random variable. And we can uh, deduce this to, uh, with a, from a Bernstein inequality. Uh, okay, so that, that, that's, that would be it for this part. Yes. Yes. Like, do we have any reverse results for like if n is like goes lower than the range e to e? Uh, then we don't have any map, linear mapping that goes that distorts the. Uh, this is a yes. This is a great question. Uh, yes, we we know that this is uh, 
Uh, so we've known for quite a long time that there are no linear mappings that uh, there are sets for which you cannot get a linear mapping with a smaller distortion. With, with this distortion and a smaller target dimension, there was a very recent uh, result by my advisor, Jelani Nelson, and his co-author. <laughs> that, in fact, there are no, there are sets of points for which uh, not, not even the distribution or just the Johnson in the stars. Well, uh, the, the, there are sets of points and points in the, the dimension D such that there is no, even if you don't care about linear map, there, is, there are no dimensionality reductions, even nonlinear with a smaller dimension than log n over epsilon squared. So this, this johnson linden stance is actually tight. There are sets of points for which you cannot get anything better. Other questions? 